So let me tell you a story on today's episode of Bedroom Forensics. As always, if you like, please subscribe. And here we go. Now serial killers like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer have thousands of books, blogs, documentaries, etc. about them. But you know what? America isn't the only place where serial killers thrive. I'm taking you to India to meet Cyanide Mahan. Born in Karnataka in 1963, Mohan Kumar Vivkand came from a family of day labourers. His father walked out on him when he was 14, but his mother, two brothers and sister remained close. So much so that when he was accused of murder, his mother threatened to commit suicide if they put him away. Spoiler alert, she's not dead. Now he had three wives. He divorced his first, but we'll come to the second two later, and four children. Now they all claimed he was a normal, simple man who was thoughtful and kind. Family and friends all said he was respectful and good-natured, a man who didn't drink or smoke. He was a teacher for 23 years, so on the outside Mohan seemed pretty normal, but he was far from it and was eventually charged with the murder of 20 women in their 20s and 30s. Now he supposedly started his murder spree in 2003, and at the same time, there was an incident when he refused a job and gave up teaching. Now, an abrupt change in circumstance does show a change in psychological behaviour. Now, this could have been his desire to be different, to act on his urges before he got too old or too tired. You know, what's starting to kill at a late age isn't actually that unusual. Not all killers torture pets in childhood and then go on sprees. Sometimes it starts small and sometimes for just monetary needs and a, what would happen if kind of scenario that eventually spirals to killing. Now, Mahan had defrauded a number of women at the schools he worked at and as well as banks. He used aliases to take out loans and didn't repay them, but his raison d'etre was death. Mohan targeted unmarried women who belonged to poor and destitute families especially those who looked past the age of marriage. He would introduce himself, mostly as a government officer, and strike conversations with them. Now, if he got a positive response, he would move on to exchanging phone numbers and then building a relationship. He never gave his real name to these women. And then once the relationship was got going, he would propose eloping to get married at a temple or registration office, and he would ask them to carry with them their finest gold jewellery and clothes for the wedding. However, he forbade them from informing their relatives about their marriage plans, so nobody would know, and to the family it seemed like these girls just disappeared. Now, he does seem quite clever, but everything to him is a high risk, and now that is a psychopathic trait. He has no empathy for others, and has a real desire just for possessions, not people. So. When Mohan had a date for this marriage, he would then take his victim off to, on a bus to distant cities. They would check into a hotel or lodge and always close to the main bus stand. There, Mohan would enter fake names and addresses in the visitor, ugh, visitor's register. He would then consummate his relationship before leaving for the temple the next day, but telling his bride to leave the gold jewellery and the clothes in the room. En route to Temple, he would then stop by the ladies' toilet at the bus stand and offer his victims a cyanide pill repackaged as contraceptive, saying that he didn't yet want to have a child. And his justification for taking the pills inside the toilets was that the women would feel the need to urinate immediately after, so they may as well be in the best place. But once they collapsed inside the toilet after consuming the cyanide, Mohan would lock them in, pick up the jewellery, and leave town immediately. On some occasions, a few days after the murder, he would even phone his victims' families and ensure them that they had gotten married, they were living a comfortable life, and that they needn't worry about their daughters. How did he get their cyanide? Well, he posed as a jeweller, because jewellers use powdered cyanide to actually clean some of their products. So he said that he was a jeweller and he got quite a few batches of cyanide from goldsmiths. But why did these women get lured into quick marriage and even sex before being wed? Well, firstly, Mohan was a smooth talker. 
and he claimed to be wealthy. And when a man in India with a stable government job proposes marriage and even declines to take a dowry, that is an offer that's difficult to say no to. So how did he get away with it for so long? When each of his victims were found in bus stand toilets, the local police would file a case of unidentified death. They would then wait for identification by the families and then perform an autopsy to see how the person died. However, in almost all cases, these women had gone to a completely different town, so the families wouldn't even know where to look, so the bodies were unidentified and then cremated. Again, the photographs of the victims that were published in local dailies weren't circulated outside of the district limits. And as I said, since the families were found far from their towns, the families failed to notice such ads. Now, police officials said Mohan got bolder and arrogant after each killing, but they didn't really try that hard themselves. And even when several women were found in bathrooms over the course of a few days, they still didn't do anything and nothing happened to Mohan. So no wonder he thought he was invincible. And the numbers of victims grew each year. One in 2004, three in 2005, four in 2006, three in 2007, two in 2008 and nine in 2009. Now after each killing, Mohan would spend time between his second wife and his third wife. He would pawn the jewellery of his victims and then use that money to take care of his families. Now, until his arrest in 2009, neither wife knew about the other's existence or the husband's crimes. So what led to his arrest wasn't surprisingly the killing of the women in the bus stations. It was another politically charged protest that was going on in India at the time over what they called jihadi love. And it was where Muslim men were seducing Hindu women with the aim of converting them. Now, this had coincided with the, the missing of 22 year old Anitha. Her family was encouraged to go to the police by these right wing militants, but the police were reluctant to do very much. But with the right wing guys on their back and they were loud, off they went to her house just to do a, a preliminary search. There they found that she'd called a mobile number often. And when they chased that mobile number, they found it was from another missing woman. And then that mobile number that she'd called was from another missing woman. And this thread was beginning to form. It seemed that Mohan had used the Sims from the missing women to start his new relationships by texting them, but had used the same mobile phone. So police followed the IME, I number, however you pronounce that, and tracked the phone to a man who said he gave it to his cousin, Mohan Kumar. Now, building their case, they found a few lucky women who'd been proposed to by Mohan, who had been using different agencies. And they had an eyewitness who saw him and Anita at the bus station leaving for Hassan. The police had their man, eventually, a long time later. So they went to his third wife's home and during a raid, they came across large quantities of cyanide powder, counterfeit government seals and receipts from the gold financing firms where he took the victim's jewellery. He was trapped. Now in court, he represented himself. Typical psychopathic behaviour, thinking he's above the law. He tried to find loopholes and he did bring up the mishandling of the case from the police, which they had no excuse really. But ultimately he failed to, in this attempt to prove his innocence. Uh, duh, there was like so much evidence. The judge when handing down his sentence said the accused was found enticing gullible women folk and unmarried girls with a false promise of securing jobs or getting married with them and later giving them deadly poison and robbing their valuables. He said, there is clear proof of guilty intention and motive. On October 12th, 2017, Mohan was sentenced to life in prison. Now he is still trying to find a way out of his prison cell. Apparently he's reading a lot of law textbooks, but he will hopefully never get out. And there we go, Cyanide Mohan, one of India's serial killers. Now, if you like this episode, please do subscribe. If you want to hear more stories or want to speak to me to speak to some experts, then please do get in touch. Until next time.